Well, Shabbat Shalom. I just want to welcome everyone to the Sabbath Day Conference Call. We just want to welcome all our family and friends that are here, and maybe you're listening to the recording. Uh, today, our discussion about the original timekeeping system is about the Sabbath day. The chronology of events covering Yeshua's death and burial conclusively prove that the Jews of Yeshua's day still observe Sabbath beginning at dawn. Sabbath begins in the morning, not at sunset. So increased light in recent years has revealed that the biblical day and thus the Sabbath begins at dawn. The argument that the Sabbath is a 24-hour period from sunset until sunset has been growing weaker and weaker with the discovery, among other proofs, that the primary text that is based on is from Leviticus 23 about Day of Atonement. So uh, that is taken out of context. So the belief in a sunset to sunset Sabbath is not found in the account of the Savior's death and burial. And so this important chronology of events establishes with absolute certainty that the hours of the Sabbath begin in the morning, not at sunset. The death of Yeshua. The purpose of this study, like I just said, is to demonstrate the impossibility of finishing the burial of Yeshua prior to sunset. And about the ninth hour, Yeshua cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Yeshua, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Matthew 27, 46, and 50. Before the invention of mechanical clocks, the daylight hours were evenly divided into 12 segments. When Yeshua asked, are there not 12 hours in a day? That's John 11:9. No one argued with him. Everyone could read a sundial and knew the day began with the coming of light. Consequently, winter hours are shorter than the hours in the summertime. Yeshua died about the ninth hour on Passover of the Eve 14. This equates to roughly 3 o'clock in the afternoon. For that time of year, shortly after the spring equinox, it was actually a bit past 3 p.m. Those who insist that the Sabbath begins at sunset believe Yeshua was taken from the cross and buried by the time the sun dropped below the horizon. In Jerusalem, at that time of year, the sun sets between 6.59 p.m. and 7.19 Careful study reveals that it would be impossible for everything recorded in Scripture to have transpired in, rough, in the roughly four hours that elapsed between the Savior's death and sunset. Okay, so I have a clock over here that shows 3 o'clock and maybe about 7 after 3 there, where Yeshua died shortly after 3. Yeshua's body was requested. When the evening was come, there was a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Yeshua's disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Yeshua. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. That's Matthew 27, 57, and 58. There are two passages of Scripture that explicitly reveal the day begins at dawn. One of them is the crucifixion account. However, Due to tradition and mistranslation, these passages are glossed over by those who insist the Sabbath begins at sunset. Tradition. People have traditionally assumed Genesis 1 teaches the day begins at sunset because of the oft-repeated phrase, quote, and the evening and the morning were the first, second, third, etc. day. However, this phrase is taken out of context. In the first chapter of Genesis, Yahuwah had already clarified what constituted a day, and that is light. 
quote, And Elohim said, Let there be light, and there was light. And Elohim saw the light, that it was good, and Elohim divided the light from the darkness. And Elohim called the light day, and the darkness he called night. That's Genesis 1, 3 through 5. Out of the impenetrable blackness of the pre-creation, the first day of creation began when Yahuwah declared, let there be light. This next act was a divided light. His next act was to divide light from dark. He then named two things he had divided. Yahuwah called the light day, and the darkness he called night. To insist, therefore, that the day begins with the darkness is to join together what Yahuwah has separated. Okay, so the light rules the day and the darkness rules the night. And uh, there's a verse over here, Psalms 136, 7 through 9. Uh, he made the great lights. His loving devotion endures forever. The sun to rule the day. His loving devotion endures forever. The moon and stars to govern the night. His loving devotion rules forever. The phrase, and there was evening and there was morning one day, must be understood in the context of light being day and associated with light and night, the period of darkness. The word translated evening and incorrectly assumed to be the night hours comes from the Hebrew word areb. This word represents the day, the time of day, immediately preceding the, and following the setting of the sun. The phrase, in the evening, literally between the evenings, means the period between sunset and darkness, or twilight. The New Strong's Expanded Dictionary of Bible Words, 2001. The word here translated into English cannot refer to the period of darkness the Creator called night because it starts prior to sunset. The light rules the day, the darkness rules the night. Therefore, if there is any bit of light still in the sky, it still counts as day. Okay, mistranslation. The second time scripture clarifies that sunset does not begin a day is, as stated, in the account of the burial of Yeshua. And also a little side note, I have, I will have all these links below, all the um, references that are numbered will be listed below. So, okay, the second time of the mistranslation is in the account of the burial of Yeshua. Specifically, when Joseph of Arimathea went to a and asked Pilate for the body, because English does not have a direct translation of the Greek word, translators chose to use the word even. Since it sounds like the word evening used in Genesis 1, the result has been confusion and continued belief that the day starts at sunset. However, this is not supported by Scripture. In fact, this brief passage in Matthew provides the clearest confirmation that the Sabbath does not start at sunset. Consider the passage again, quote, When the evening was come, even was come, there came a rich man named Joseph who went to Pilate and begged the body of Yeshua. That's Matthew 27, 57 to 58 with reduction. The word even here comes from the Greek word aposios, apo, apsios, excuse me. And while similar, its common usage does not have an identical meaning to the Hebrew word used in Genesis 1. This word means nightfall. The word really signifies the late evening the latter of the two evenings as reckoned by the Jews. The first from 3 p.m. to sunset, the latter after sunset. 
This is the usual meaning. It is, it is used, however, of both. That's New Strong's Expanded Dictionary of the Bible Words, 2001. Even without any of the additional chronological evidence, this alone should be a, a sufficient to establish forever that the Sabbath does not begin at sunset, because the common usage of the word reveals Joseph did not even approach Pilate for permission to take the body until after sunset. The purpose of this study, however, is not to prove that Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate after sunset. It's to demonstrate the impossibility of finishing the burial of Yeshua prior there were a lot of tasks and a lot of time uh, left, and so this is what this study is about. The common usage of opsios refers to after sunset, but because it was occasionally used of the period of time from mid-afternoon to sunset, the earlier time will be used here. Again, this is not the common usage of the word, but because it was used occasionally to refer to the late afternoon hours prior to sunset, that will be the starting point for our study. For the sake of argument throughout this study, the shortest, most conservative time estimates were always chosen. The Gospels were careful to specify which of the Savior's followers were present at his time of death. Neither Joseph of Arimathea nor Nicodemus were listed as being there in any gospel account. The presence of such high-ranking followers would most certainly have been mentioned had they been there. Due to the length of hours at that time of year, Yeshua most likely died around 3.10 p.m. It would have taken time for Joseph Arathea to learn of his death. Some of the Jews had come to gloat over the Savior's death, returned to Jerusalem afterwards, frightened by the darkness and the earthquake. And all the people that came together at the sight, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. That's Luke 30, 23, 48. It would still have taken time for word to reach Joseph, it's not unreasonable to assume it took at least 45 minutes to an hour or more for Joseph to learn Yeshua had died. It would certainly have taken him a little time to recover from the sheer shock and grief and decide on a course of action and proceed. He may even, at this point, have consulted with Nicodemus. We are talking about real human hearts and real human emotions and responses. Even... If Joseph learned of the Savior's death in a fairly short order, it's not realistic to assume that the minute he received word, he went to ask for the body. He would have spent at least a little time grieving. It then would have taken a few minutes to walk from his home to where Pilate was staying. He would arrive there no earlier than 4.30 in the afternoon. Okay, so we have Yeshua dying about 3 o'clock, and then uh, this is about 4.30 now. Joseph may well have been high-ranking Jew, but Pilate still outranked him. It would have taken a few minutes for the guards to send Joseph's request to Pilate and return with an answer, granting him an audience. Conservative, conserva conservatively estimating that Joseph went to Pilate at around 4.30, the very soonest he would have made it into Pilate, and this is rushing it a bit, would have been 4.45 p.m. Okay, so the earliest Joseph would have had an audience with Pilate would have been about 4.45 p.m., and maybe even later than that. Pilate is shocked and disbelieving. Death by crucifixion was slow and agonizing death. 
It is from the word crucify that we get the word excruciating, simplifying, ex signifying extremely intense agony, agony. It always took several days for the muscles to finally collapse and the victim to, to die of asphyxiation. However, Yeshua did not die of asphyxiation. He died from a burst heart. Pilate did not know this. So when Joseph asked permission to take the body, quote, Pilate marveled that he was already dead. That's Mark 12:44. To put it bluntly, Pilate did not believe anyone could die from crucifixion so quickly. He, quote, called unto him the centurion and asked him whether he had been, had been any while dead. And when he knew the truth of the centurion, of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. That's Mark 15, 44 through 45. Okay, so um, this took some time because Pilate did not live in Jerusalem. He lived in Caesarea. And records indicate he only came to Jerusalem at the times of the national festivals when the Jews were known to be more likely to riot. So recent archaeological discoveries reject the previously suggested scenario of Pilate staying at the Antonia Fortress and indicate that it was far more likely that Pilate was a guest of Herod Antipas in the palace built by Herod the Great. And so here's a picture over here in the model of Herod's palace where Pilate was believed to have been staying as a guest during this time of the year was the Passover time of year. Gaining admission to the palace to speak to Pilate likely took longer than the 15 minutes allotted in this study. Certainly by the time Joseph was ushered in to see Pilate, had exchanged greetings in accordance with Oriental custom, stated his request, listened to Pilate's astonishing, astonished questions, then listen again as Pilate gave command for a messenger to be sent for the centurion in charge of Golgotha, more time would have elapsed. At the very earliest, it would have been 5 p.m. and more likely 5.15 or later, depending upon when Joseph arrived and began seeking permission to gain an audience with Pilate. For the sake of argument, however, we will put the time at a conservative 5 p.m. Okay, the place of crucifixion was about one kilometer, and that's less than, uh, actually, it's just about a half a mile away uh, from here. It's Palace, and uh, that's uh, reference number four. A healthy soldier could traverse this in a matter of minutes, particularly if he were on a horse. But it must be remembered that the centurion would have been slowed by the multitudes of pilgrims that had thronged to Jerusalem for Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. By the time, one, a messenger was called for, given a message, and sent, two, made his way through the masses of people, three, relayed the order, four, the centurion gave orders, appointing another soldier to remain in charge while he was gone. Five, and then the centurion made his own way back through the crowds. The time would have likely been at least 5.15. So I have that time over here and a little clock off. By the time the centurion arrived to answer Pilate's question, it would have been at least 5.15. And remember, sunset, that time of year in Jerusalem was about 7.20. So Pilate grants permission for Joseph to take the body. And this is from Mark 15.44. And when he knew the truth of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. It's impossible to know whether Pilate simply gave a verbal command to the centurion to release Joseph's body, Yeshua's body, to Joseph of Arimathea, or whether he wrote out a command on parchment. Regardless, by the time the centurion was granted entrance, asked Pilate's question, answered Pilate's question, assured him of the Savior's death, Pilate granted permission 
and Joseph took his leave, the quickest elapsed time would be at least another 15 minutes, bringing the time to 5.30 p.m. If Pilate sent for a scribe to write out the command and seal it with his signet ring, it would have pushed back Joseph's departure from the palace by another 15 minutes at a minimum. Okay, so we have 5.30 now by the time the order is written out. So uh, this is a picture of Jerusalem at the time of Yeshua. In uh, Galgatha, you'll see it was way up there, about a kilometer, which I said is about a little over a half a mile away from Herod's palace. And anyone traversing the distance would be slowed down by all the throngs of the visitors that were gathered there for the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay, Joseph prepares for the burial, Mark 15, 45 to 46. And when he knew it of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph, and he bought, and he, talking about Joseph, bought fine linen. Joseph did not immediately rush to Golgotha. He had not known if he would have even get permission to take the body of the convicted of a convicted criminal. After obtaining permission, he did the following. He returned home to give instructions to his servants to begin gathering together the tools and supplies needed to remove the body from the cross, carry it to the burial site, and there cleanse it and prepare it for burial. Two, he likely sent word to Nicodemus, since Nicodemus knew to come and bring spices for the burial. Three, he went or sent a servant to go and purchase burial linens. That's Mark 15, 46. Okay, so John 19, 40 says, Then they took the body of Yeshua and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. So embalming spices were used when they could be afforded. Myrrh and aloes were among the spices wrapped with Yeshua's body. While some might question how Joseph could purchase burial bindings late in the afternoon on Passover, there are three important points to remember. These apply equally to the scenario if the common use of the word opsius is accepted, indicating that Joseph knew or went to Pilate after sunset. Passover was a work day. Either, excuse me, one, Passover was work day, two, Either the shops were still open, or three, he was able to track down shop owners who would not hesitate to sell some, even at night, due to the rigorous burial requirements of the Jews that necessitated immediate burial. It is conceivable that Joseph could purchase burial cloths after sunset. The Jews, always known for their unrelenting drive to make money, would still have had shops open after sunset. In Amos 8, the Jews were not denounced for selling at night. Rather, they were denounced for wanting to hasten past the sacred hours of the Sabbath. Quote, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, when will the new moon be gone, that we may see, sell corn? And the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel great, and satisfying the, balance by de the balances by deceit. That's Amos 8, 4, 5. Note that if all the shops routinely closed at sunset, there would have been no express desire to rush the sacred hours because all would know they could not open up shop until the next day anyway. So if the shops were closed, however, Joseph would have tracked down those who sold burial wrappings in their homes. And in many countries, even to this day, owners live above or behind their shops. So it would not have been a difficult thing for him to purchase burial clothes, even in the late afternoon or evening. 
but this would have still taken more time as the shopkeeper would be celebrating or getting ready to celebrate Passover with his family and friends. So assuming Joseph knew right where to go and did not make any unnecessary detours, just getting there would have taken some time too. Jerusalem was not a modern city laid out with broad straight boulevards. Its streets were narrow, twisting, and crowded with stalls and pilgrims. And Galgatha was only a few hundred meters outside of the city gate. However, it was fully one kilometer from Herod's palace. If one adds to that one kilometer distance, the additional distances walked by Joseph as he returned to his home, went to find and purchase burial clothes, and returned home to gather the rest of what was needed, traveled to the city gate, it all adds up to the accumulation of time passing. From when Joseph took his leave of Pilate to when he left for Golgotha, at least two hours would have passed, very likely even more. It is reasonable to assume that Joseph and Nicodemus likely met at the city gates and proceeded to Calvary together. Adding up the other activities that occurred since Joseph first went to Pilate, this would have brought him at the earliest to about 7.30 as he started out toward Golgotha with servants and probably a donkey to carry or two to carry the necessary supplies. When the realistic time constraints involved in this process are carefully considered, it quickly becomes apparent that burial by sunset that would be at six, between 6.59 and 7.19, is impossible. Therefore, if the earliest and shortest time possible are assumed, the sun had already set by the time Joseph left the city. Okay, so Joseph, and with servants and supplies, would have left for Gilgatha after sunset. Removing the body. Mark 15:46, and took him down. Joseph took him down. It would not have taken long for Joseph, Nicodemus, and the servants to reach Golgotha. It was, after all, purposely situated along the main road into Jerusalem. Arriving there with Pilate's permission to remove the body, they would have found a busy scene. Some time after Yeshua died, the Jews, observing, the Jews observing the proceedings decided none of the bodies could remain on the crosses as the next day was the Sabbath and the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay, so we have a biblical calendar up here to remind you about the feast day that the Passover was always on the 14th. And that was the preparation day. That's the day Yeshua died. And then the next day was the Sabbath, the first day of unleavened bread. And here are all the Sabbaths in a row. But the 15th was the Sabbath. And then the 16th would have been the day of first fruits. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation, and the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, well, that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and broke the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Yeshua and saw that he was already dead, they broke not his legs. That's John 19, 31 through 33. This passage provides still additional proof that the Sabbath could not have begun at sunset, consider the following facts. First, Pilate was shocked anyone could die so quickly from crucifixion, and so he sent for the centurion in charge of the execution to question him. Second, the centurion confirmed Yeshua's death. Third, had the Jews gone to Pilate for permission to break the legs of the condemned before Joseph went to him, the governor would not have needed to send for the centurion to confirm Yeshua's death. He would have already known he was dead from the asphyxiation brought on by having his legs broken. 
So the Jews thus went to Pilate for permission to hasten the death of the other two prisoners. And so Joseph had received permission to take the body, and they presented their request to Pilate, most likely while Joseph was coordinating with Nicodemus for the burial of Yeshua. Removing the Savior's body from the cross would have been a time-consuming, laborious task. Scripture records that none of Yeshua's bones are broken in accordance with the prophecy. Joseph, Nicodemus, and their servants would have been extremely careful while removing the body. But even so, it was so easy. It was no easy task to remove such large spikes driven deep into the wood. In fact, archaeologists have uncovered bones in an ostery or a bone box still containing spikes. Clearly, whoever buried the body had been unable to remove the spike or, at the least, deemed it not worth the effort. So over here is a picture of the garden uh, tomb, the garden tomb. And John 19, 41 to 42 says, Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein was never a man laid yet. There lay the Yeshua. Therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day for the sepulcher was at hand. So they laid him there. Joseph and Nicodemus would have spent whatever time necessary to very carefully, reverently remove the body from the cross. They were not rushed to go eat past the Passover meal they were engaged in the most important event of their lives. They then would have had servants carry it to the garden tomb, which was close by. This could easily have taken an hour to complete, bringing their crude time lapse to 8.30 p.m. Okay, so removing the body without further damage was a difficult task. And like our Brother Pete just said, it would have been at least 8.30 p.m., by the time they were finished. Cleansing for the body, for the burial. And that was done uh, in the Jewish um, people. And this is from Luke twenty-three fifty-three. And he took it down, that's Joseph, and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone, wherein never man before was laid. Preparing the body for burial was, is always time-consuming, with the severe abuse suffered by, Savior, by the Savior prior to death, combined with the ritual. So if the Jewish burial process, it would have been even more so. Joseph, as a very wealthy man, had a freshly hewn tomb prepared for his wife and himself in a restful garden. There was in that location an extremely large reservoir for the collecting of rainwater. They had plenty of water available, but it would still have been an extremely lengthy, difficult task to cleanse a body so torn and marred. Every bucket full of water would have been lowered and raised, the hair and what remained of the beard washed. Ritual cleansing goes far beyond a quick rinse. The degree of cleansing needed would have likely have necess necessitated at least two hours. At this point, it would have been around 10.30 at night. Okay, I don't know about you, but going through all these steps and how awful it was and the cleansing of his hair and how everything would have been matted and bloody and everything, it's really putting my thoughts back to the crucifixion a lot. So by now, it is 10.30 at night from all these steps. Wrapping the body for burial, John 19, 39 to 40. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Yeshua by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then they took the body of Yeshua and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Once the body was thoroughly cleansed, the painstaking work of wrapping it with the burial 
with the binding cloths and spices yet remain. Unlike bodies placed in, in coffins in the Western world, no one part of the body was supposed to be touching another part. The arms and legs all had to have cloths separately separating them. The hands and feet were typically bound separately, as was the face. That this was the typical practice can be concluded from the description given in the, the description given in Scripture of Lazarus after his resurrection. Quote, and he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. And Yeshua said unto them, Loose him and let him go. That's John eleven forty four. To the Jewish mind, the burial process was tremendously important. If a body were not properly buried, the individual was considered cursed of Yahuwah. Therefore, the process of burying a body, particularly that of one well-loved, would have been a thorough and meticulously careful process. Not everyone was buried wrapped in spices. Only kings and a few wealthy could afford the embalming spices. King Hezekiah stored spices in his treasure house. They were considered part of his wealth. Quote, the spices mentioned as being used by Nicodemus for the preservation of Savior's body, John 19, 39-40, were myrrh and aloes, by which latter word must be understood not the aloes of medicine, but the highly scented wood of the Aquilorean <laughs> Aglicum, end quote. Some researchers have suggested that the value of the spices brought by Nic Nicodemus was upwards of $200,000 in today's market. So a 100-pound weight of spices is an immense quantity of extremely expensive spices. Myrrh was a liquid. Aloes were powdered. The ritual of wrapping a body with spices was far more than just a quickie mummy job with handfuls of incense tossed in. Each part of the body must be wrapped individually in several layers. The mixture of liquid and powdered spices were applied to each layer carefully and reverently. It was an extremely time-consuming process. The meticulous wrapping of the body with the spices could easily have taken up to two hours, if not more, to complete. And thus, this time accumulated would have brought them to shortly after midnight. So I have a clock up here at 12.30. Wrapping a body with spices was extremely time-consuming, as we just mentioned, and it would have been at least 12.30 now or after midnight. Okay, now we're going to talk about the burial. Luke 23.53. And he took it down and wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone, wherein never man before was laid. By the time the body was wrapped, it would have taken only a few minutes to finally lay the body to rest in the tomb. Rolling the stone into place, bundling up bloodied rags, and collecting the tools used to remove the Savior from the cross would not have taken very long. By 1250, a.m., the sad party would have turned its exhausted steps toward home. Okay, so um, here's a map again about the Jerusalem at the time of Yeshua. So these women that were with the men uh, would have taken it about 20 or 15 minutes to return from the tomb. Now we're going to talk about the women Luke twenty three fifty five to 56. And the women also, which came with him from Galilee, followed after, and beheld the sepulcher, and how his body was laid. 
and they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. In Middle Eastern cultures, family members are the ones to prepare bodies for burial. The women of the family prepared the body if the deceased was a woman, while male family members prepared the body if the deceased was a man. Various sources suggest that Joseph of Arimathea was of the family of Yeshua, so it's logical that he would have been involved would have been involved in the Savior's burial. As recorded in Scripture, the women stayed back and were not involved with the burial process. They longed to do something for the burial as well, but the preparation of the body for burial was the work of men. Instead, they watched from a respectful distance, determining to gather spices and ointments to anoint the body after it was wrapped. So once the stone was rolled into place, there was nothing more to do at the tomb. So the women returned home, probably in the company of the men for protection. And this was not a hurried journey. They had been up all night, and they were mentally, emotionally, and physically exhausted. There is, of course, no way to determine precisely where the women lived, but if they lived in the general vicinity of the upper room, they were over a kilometer away from the sepulcher. If they lived in the lower city, it took even longer to return home. Going with a shorter distance, however, it would have taken them around 15 or 20 minutes to tiredly traverse the distance from the sepulcher to their home. The women may well have used the time to discuss their next course of action. They wanted to appoint their beloved, anoint their beloved master's body. They wanted some small part in honoring him too. Upon returning to their homes, they made diligent search for the anointing spices they had available. Luke says the women, quote, prepared spices and ointments. However, it's clear from the biblical account that when comparing and assembling what they had on hand, they realized they did not have a sufficient amount. Nothing could be done at that point because the Sabbath was beginning to dawn. Therefore, they rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. That's Luke 23, 56. Once the Sabbath was passed and the market stalls reopened for business, the women bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. That's Mark 16, 1. As much as they longed to return to the tomb to anoint Yeshua's body, they waited. They couldn't buy the additional spices they needed until Sabbath was passed anyway. They knew the best way to honor him was to obey him. He had said, if you love me, keep my commandments, John 14, 15. They kept the Sabbath day holy to honor the master of the Sabbath. As previously stated, it is reasonable to assume that the women returned to Jerusalem with the men allowing 15 minutes for the return trip, this would, have, this would have had them back home around 1.05 in the morning. The women returned to their individual homes, looked through the supplies they had, and then gathered together once more to consult on what supplies they lacked that must, have, that must be purchased once the Sabbath was passed, as this was the middle of the night. Obviously, no shops would be open. Reasonably speaking, this would have taken a minimum of an hour, bringing the time to just after 2 a.m. The Sabbath dawns, Luke 23:54, And that day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew on. The Gospel account of the death and burial of Yeshua is greatly abbreviated. The Bible only hits at the amount of time involved hints at the amount of, amount of time involved in the burial process. However, when the list of events is taken step by step, then important words are looked up in the Greek, the facts become clear. The burial of Yeshua could not have occurred prior to sunset. If the more common use 
of Opsios is accepted, it took almost the entire night. That's Opsiosos, is, num- is Strong's 379, late evening, the latter of the two evenings as reckoned by the Jews, the latter after sunset. Everything that occurred during the night hours was considered part of the sixth day of the week, the preparation day. According to the Gospel of Luke, they did not finish until the next day when the Sabbath began to dawn. Although this is not apparent in the English translation, the original Greek establishes this without question. So the phrase translated drew on in this text is a Greek word, I don't know. Can you pronounce that, Brother Pete? <laughs> uh, Epiphosco. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, uh, well, I'll let you finish reading this because we've got some Greek here. You go ahead. <laughs> All right. I'm brave. The definition is startling. Quote, to begin to grow light, begin to dawn. End quote. It is a form of Greek Strong's Greek 2017, epiphia, uh, epiphiao, which means to illuminate, to give light. Because they waited until evening to even begin the process of seeking permission to take the body, taking it down, cleaning it and wrapping it, etc., it took them the night hours to do their work. They did not finish until the Sabbath began as it started to grow light. The New Strong's Expanded Dictionary of the Bible Words expounds on this definition, stating epitheosko, quote, is said of the approach of the Sabbath, end quote. If the word is used in reference to the approach of the Sabbath, and if the word itself means to begin to dawn, end quote, the conclusion is obvious. The Sabbath began with the dawning of light, not the setting of the sun and the subsequent gathering of darkness. In Jerusalem, sunset at that time of year occurs between 545 and 627 a.m. However, dawn, the beginning of a light, arrives even earlier. Astronomical twilight in Jerusalem for April comes between 5.05 early in the month and 4.20 and 4.25 a.m. at the end of the month as the days lengthen toward the summer solstice. Yeah, so uh, we had uh, read earlier that Jerusalem sunset would have been about 7.20 in the evening and uh, their sunrise looks like it was about 6 o'clock in the morning. But astronomical twilight um, is still dawn, but it's very, very dark out. Uh, you would need a light to see. And that's at about 5 o'clock that time of year in Jerusalem. As stated previously, the shortest time estimates were deliberately chosen for this study. There is no need to artificially inflate the time blocks involved. Either the entire process could be completed before sunset, or it could not. Assuming Joseph sought permission to take the body before sunset brings us now to the women preparing the spice, preparing spices for anointing. They would have realized they did not have enough on the way to purchase more in the middle of the night. They laid aside their efforts until they could buy more at once the Sabbath was passed. By our calculations, this was about seven hours after sunset. Amazingly, though, our conservative estimates are off by about four hours. In other words, Scripture makes clear the process actually took more time than allowed for in our study. E-Bible clearly states that Sabbath was beginning to dawn as they laid aside their preparations. Therefore, by the time the burial work of the men was complete, they had returned to Jerusalem 
the women had gathered the anointing spices they had and realized they needed more, was actually closer to 5 o'clock in the morning. The Sabbath Abib 15 arrived with dawn, and the women rested according to the commandment. Okay, so then we have the biblical calendar up here again, which shows Passover is the 14th, is preparation day, and, and the very dawn of the day was Sabbath, but, and also the first day of unleavened bread, the 15th. The Resurrection. Mark 16, 1-2. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. It is here that there is yet one last confirmation that the day begins with dawn, not sunset. Quote, In the end of the Sabbath, as it was began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. That's Matthew 28, 1. The phrase, began to dawn, comes from the exact same word used in Luke 23:54 to indicate that the Sabbath drew on as the women laid aside their preparations because the Sabbath was beginning, it means to begin to grow light, began or begin to dawn. Toward is a word that indicates movement in the direction of something. It is a good translation of the Greek word ice, which is also expresses motion and indicates a point reached. This word would not have been used if first day had started at sunset the evening before. It was only as the light, quote, began to dawn toward the first day of the week, end quote, that the day began. If the Jews began their day at sunset, they would have begun every day at sunset, including the first day of the week. However, Matthew 28.1 clearly states that after the Sabbath was over, it ended with the leaving of the light the night before, as it began to grow light toward the first day of the week, that is, the first day of the week had not started at sunset the night before, the women returned to the tomb to anoint Yeshua's body. This was the feast of firstfruits, that is, of Eve 16. Okay, and that is the first day of the week because we had Passover, the preparation day, Sabbath, the 15th, and the first fruits is the first day of the week. It was dawning toward the first day of the week, and Yeshua was the first fruits. That was Resurrection Day. He's not here. He has risen. Psalms 119.18 Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. The omniscient wisdom of Yahuwah had deliberately designed the death of his only begotten son in every particular. His foreknowledge knew that the truth of the Sabbath would be hidden for nearly 2,000 years. The very last act of a selfless life was to leave a record, a chronology of events which, when studied out carefully, could demonstrate to believers of the last generation the truth about when Sabbath begins. Saturday Sabbatarians, who, observing the Sabbath from sunset Friday evening to sunset Saturday evening, want to fix the entire chronology of events in between Yeshua's death shortly after 3 p.m. and sunset around 7, less than four hours. However, this is an impossible task. As demonstrated, the most conservative time estimates reveal the process 
would have taken nine hours at the very least. And, as proven by the Times for astronomical twilight, dawn, the entire process actually took longer than estimated. There is simply no way to fit in everything that took place within the four-hour time span. Furthermore, to do so contradicts the following facts as spelled out in Scripture. If the common usage of the word opsios is accepted, Joseph of Arimathea did not approach Pilate for permission to take the body until after sunset. That's Matthew 27, 58 through 50, 57 through 58. Even if Joseph went to Pilate prior to sundown, it still would have been impossible to fit the entire chronology of events into a narrow four-hour window of time. Two, after receiving permission to bury the body, Joseph went to purchase burial cloths. That's Mark 14, 40, 15, 46. Three, the burial process was so lengthy Scripture states the new day was already beginning to dawn as the women laid aside their preparations and rested over the Sabbath. That's Luke 23:54. 4. Four, after the Sabbath was passed, the women went and purchased more spices with which to anoint the body. That's Luke 23:56 and Mark 16:1. The women returned to the sepulchre as the day, quote, began to dawn toward the first day of the week. That's Matthew 28, 1. Okay, so over here on the left, um, we have uh, the time period starting out with 3 o'clock, the ninth hour when Yeshua was crucified, and going through several hours of um, getting the body, permission for the body, all the burial procedures, and that conservatively ended up at 2 a.m., but we know over here in Scripture it says that um, that the Sabbath was beginning to dawn when the ladies um, uh, went to, knew that they would have to wait to purchase more. So um, here we go. The Sabbath is beginning to dawn, so that was probably 5 a.m., and we only did a time period to 2 a.m. So the chronology of events of Yeshua's death and burial solidly establishes the fact that the biblical day and the seventh-day Sabbath begins at dawn, not sunset, as we were taught. It is past time to lay aside the errors of tradition and assumption and welcome the holy Sabbath hours as intended, from the coming of the light at dawn until the light leaves at night. Anything else is merely traditional based on faulty assumptions. So remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And I want to thank uh, Brother Pete uh, for reading along and uh, thank everyone that's here today. And I hope you'll go back and uh, watch this uh, YouTube and slow it down and stop and read everything for yourself and study it out. So Shabbat Shalom.